and welcome to the Telematic Laser, which is a Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous, which is a program of the Leonardo International Society of the Arts, Sciences and Technology. The Telematic Laser is co-hosted quarterly by myself, Paul Sermon from the University of Brighton Centre for Digital Media Cultures, and Randall Packer from the Third Space Network in Washington, DC. So this is an entirely uh, online laser node, hence its telematic title, and it's the fourth telematic laser event since the node was established last year. So, but tonight I'm joined by my co-host, uh, Dr. Sintenza Gill from the Center for Music and Science at the University of Cambridge, who is currently collaborating with me on the UKRI Arts and Humanities Research Council COVID-19 response project, Collaborative Solutions for the Performing Arts at Telepresent Stage. Uh, which in this panel discussion will be included is contributes to that project. So I'd like to start with just a brief note about the project before we start, if I may. So the Telepresent Stage is a project led by myself at the University of Brighton in collaboration with LaSalle College of Arts in Singapore and the Third Space Network in Washington, DC. It, in response to the COVID-19 impact on the performing arts sector, this project aims to identify new and creative ways for actors, dancers, and other performing arts professionals to rehearse and interact together in shared online spaces and to produce collaborative live performances from remote sites. So in a dramatic shift from the paradigm of web conference grids, such as Zoom and Teams, the Telepresent Stage project is working with eight UK performing arts companies to identify conceptual and technical solutions to break free from these isolating constraints and provide altogether a new platform where our experience of online connection is heightened and re-envisioned through the superimposition of our bodies in virtual space. So this evening's panel discussion, All the World's a Screen, brings together three prominent performance technology and Shakespeare specialists, that Pascal Abisha, Lucy Askew, and, and Sarah Ellis who have each conf confronted the effects of the pandemic on the performing arts through distinctive and innovative approaches to online theatre. So each panellist will be giving a short presentation and we will provide a brief opportunity for questions after each talk before the full panel discussion, which Satinda and I will start and then open up to all attendees. So the aim of the panel is to provide a unique opportunity to present, contrast and discuss the panellists' work as well as the conceptual and technical challenges they have faced in the pursuit of newfound digital aesthetics that define a language of online theatre. So if I may just set the stage with the following provocations, how is it possible to convey tragedy, comedy and magic through code, 3D modelling, live audio and video streams and interactive systems? And how have, how have online theatre audiences learned to suspend their disbelief in new and necessary ways. Overlooking the occasional technical glitch or even embracing it as the authenticity of liveness, negotiating latency, navigating time zones and identifying with a mirrored image of, the, of self are all new online phenomena. But how do we overcome them or turn them to our advantage? All theatre is essentially technical. But what are the advantages, disadvantages, and distinct differences between online and physical theatre? Whilst online theatre has presented new forms of dramaturgy and choreography through new paradigms, structures and experience, is it essentially reframing how we touch, how we feel intimacy and experience proprioception for both performers and audiences? Or is it extending our understanding of these essential qualities? So, to address some of these questions, I'd like to hand over to Satinda Gill to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Paul. Welcome, everyone. Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Pascal Abisher, um, who is Professor of Shakespeare and Early Modern Performance Studies at the University of Exeter. Um, she has a particular interest in bodies and performance technologies, from candlelight through social media to live theatre broadcasts and digital performance. And Pascal has published extensively on the subject, including her forth, forthcoming publication, Viral Shakespeare Performance in the Time of Pandemic. This is a Cambridge Element publication on the shift to the digital and its effect on audience communities in lockdown. 
Pascal is also currently leading the coordination of the ARHRC's COVID-19 research portfolio as principal investigator of the pandemic and beyond, the arts and humanities contribution to COVID research and recovery. Um, and at this point, just before Pascal, um, we have Pascal speak, um, I'd like to bring Paul back in because uh, we're going to show a video clip. So Paul, oh. over to you. Well, that's okay. We're, I think we're going to show the clip. It's a tender after. It's actually a clip that's going to be just before Lucy. So we'll let. Oh, okay. We'll, <laughs> that's me. quite all right. That was a blip. We're going to show part. a clip just before Lucy's talk that relates my to that apologies. one. That's fine. No, no problem my at all. Apologies. Over to you, In Pascal. Case, yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, is this working? Uh, are you seeing my screen? Wonderfully. That's it. Marvelous. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I thought that uh, I would I would set the stage um, by by talking about the work that has led me to write about both Sarah and Lucy's uh, involvement in digital theatre, uh, and it all started with with the discussions within performance studies of the many ways in which technologies of performance and in particular digital media. Uh, and the use of video are thought to be threatening the experience of co-presence that is seen as fundamental to theatrical performance. And uh, I've been arguing for a long time that we're wrong to think of these media as fundamentally different from their precursors. So I'm, I'm arguing for a sort of historical continuity in, in which the things that we've experienced of late are not so much disruptors as uh, a continuation of things that were happening before, but using different media. Because performance has always involved technologies that either bring a performer into direct contact with their audience, or conversely, that separate the performer from uh, the audience. And in Shakespeare's day, there were stage te technologies and architectural features uh, in the design of theatres that allowed performers to activate three basically different ways for the spectator to engage with the performer. And the first um, is, is dependent on that, the interactivity which we've got used to identifying with the edges of the globe stage, um, which allows performers to step to that edge of the platform, look at the audience around them in broad daylight and engage in direct eye contact with their audience and in a reciprocal dialogue uh, with that audience. And this is what Robert Weimann years ago described as the platea mode of interaction that acknowledges the presence of the audience in the performance. And it's also the mode of performance that has been theorized as being particularly able to foster an ethical reciprocity uh, between the performer and the spectator as they become able to respond to and be responsible for one another. And this sense of ethical reciprocity is often seen as, as fundamentally linked to the special sense of co-presence in unmediated performance. So, so that's a really purist view of theatre as, as being entirely defined by uh, being in the same space at the same time. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum within the early modern theatre is a locus mode of performing that is associated with the upstage area uh, in the in the early modern theatre that separates the fictional action on the stage from the real world inhabited by the spectators. Uh, in this mode of performance, there's absolutely no interaction and there's an imaginary fourth wall that allows the spectators to view the action without being able to respond to the performers. And the third mode of spectatorship on the early modern stage, I've, I've argued in my last book, uh, is associated with the so-called discovery space at the rear of the stage. And this is an opening in the upstage wall through which the offstage action can be glimpsed, but not seen entirely. And in Shakespeare's theater, it's, it's often the most hideous acts of violence that are relegated to that half on, half offstage space. So that's where rape and murder are normally located. Um, and because you can't really show those obscene offstage actions very clearly, 
the relegation to zone that is part on and part of the stage activates the obscene imagination of the spectators. So spectators are asked to project themselves into that offstage space um, and to flesh out the details that they can't quite see. And in this obscene mode, performance requires the spectator to make an active ethical choice about what it is that they imagine is happening uh, off stage and how they are positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis the thing that they're imagining. In Shakespeare's tragedy, the obscene, to, to, to borrow Andrew Sofa's term, um, becomes the tidal force of gravity that pulls at us unseen. And when actions go off stage, audiences are asked to project themselves into the offstage zone in order to supplement the scene with its imagined obscene uh, equivalent. Now, my argument is that these three fundamental modes of spectatorship, the the platea, the locus and the obscene are not so much disrupted by the use of digital media and technologies of performance as that they're actually intensified by those technologies. And much of the work that Sarah uh, has been doing with the RSC has used digital technologies to create precisely those sorts of interactive platea modes of engagement, which are traditionally associated uh, with direct to address to the audience from the edges of the Royal Shakespeare Theatre or the Globe stage. Now, one example of this work is the Midsummer Night's Dreaming production going back to 2013, uh, deep prehistory. Um, now, alongside the live performance, which Gregory Doran directed in Stratford-upon-Avon, Sarah collaborated with Google Plus's Creative Lab to create an online wood without the town that was inspired by the activity of the play and that wrapped itself around the live performance. And what Sarah's team called the online stage of uh, hashtag dream 40 uh, accommodated over 3000 social media posts by worldwide audience members and by a 12 strong creative team at RSC who were able to interact directly with one another on this virtual platea. And that online stage was navigable through uh, a network of roads and links that connected the thoughts and the movements of a host of characters who only existed by virtue of the imagined offstage lives of Shakespeare's characters. So in, in other words, the online stage was populated by in everyone and everything that is offstage in Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, although there were some male figures in the virtual woods, the, the collective tidal force of gravity of uh, this offstage digital world pulled Shakespeare's dream into a social network uh, in which women, um, such as Mrs. Snug and Bottom's mum and my favourite Mrs. Aegeus, uh, were the dominant creative forces. They were sewing the line costumes, they were writing newspaper columns and cooking potions. And as you can hear, uh, see, they were also heckling the male characters and the RSC itself with some uncomfortable truths about gender equality. Um, now, amongst these characters, I was particularly fascinated by an intruder from another play, uh, namely Ophelia, who in, in this alternative universe was Lysander's sister. It's through her painfully intimate vlogs that this production was able to explore what might happen to Hermia if she were indeed locked into a nunnery. And what was really fascinating about these vlogs was how they activated the obscene imagination by actually only showing fragments of the story and of uh, Ophelia's own body, so that you as an audience member were constantly asked to project yourself into that story, to flesh it out and to understand that particular story of somebody who is imprisoned and who might, just might, escape the patriarchal regime of Shakespeare's dream. So in doing so, she exposed the extent to which the, the play's own joyful environment and its happy resolution are profoundly predicated on the disciplining of women's bodies and the sort of rigorous policing of their sexuality. So 
what this early experiment with hybrid modes of performance at the RSC reveals, therefore, is the ability of digital media to activate precisely the types of interaction and modes of, of ethical engagement for audiences uh, that are traditionally associated with live analog performance. So the online stage acted as both a platea space uh, and as an obscene space into which spectators could project themselves and engage with the murky underbelly of Shakespeare's comedy. And intriguingly, uh, the, the live analog performance in Stratford-upon-Avon was actually relegated to a locus to which we only had access through brief glimpses, small little clips uh, that you could see, but you could never really interact with. Uh, so it was the digital world that contained the more engaging, exciting and ethically uh, involving interactions. And since then, Sarah's work has uh, become ever more ambitious and sort of big scale. She started to collaborate with, with giants such as Intel. Um, and uh, she, she started to bring performance capture technology in particular into mainstream stages. And I'm sure she'll, she'll tell you more about her recent uh, work on Dream. I certainly hope she will talk about Dream um, later on. Uh, but here I'll just point out uh, that for that performance too, her team seemed to work really hard to create some spaces for digital interaction that empowered audiences to co-create aspects of this virtual world. Uh, and I think there's, it's no coincidence that there were also Q&A sessions at the end uh, as an attempt to bring the audience into the performance and, and into dialogue with the actors. Uh, and that idea of a dialogue brings me to Lucy. Uh, and to the work that Creation Theatre, in collaboration with Big Telly and Zoe Seaton, uh, have been doing since the start of the pandemic, because the, the work that they've produced has been totally extraordinary. Uh, they not only pivoted in record time from analogue, immersive, site-specific, promenade-style performance to using the Zoom platform, as a performance stage, uh, but in doing so, they also massively increased the reach and access of, of their audiences to their work. And what excites me most, obviously, is how they have managed uh, to use Zoom to generate precisely the types of uh, interaction that we know from the Shakespearean stage. And in doing so, they've managed to translate into a virtual environment, the sense of community and of ethical involvement with the performance and with other members of the audience, uh, which many thought was only possible in analog settings. And the, the research that I did uh, with Rachel Nicholas on their, their production of The Tempest uh, showed the extent to which audiences were energized by the ability to, to interact with the performers and to co-create key parts of the production, with many of them reporting how this sense of community has helped their mental health during lockdown. Now, in both The Tempest and Big Telly's Later Macbeth, the Zoom platform was used really dynamically. Um, so you had characters uh, such as Miranda and Ferdinand, um, and also Lady Macbeth, uh, who were really completely unaware of the existence of an audience. For them, Zoom was clearly a locus stage. Um, there was no way that there was a connection. But for other characters, uh, there was an opportunity to casually throw a glance or an aside at the audience, as you, as you can see here. Um, uh, and there was therefore an, a, a sort of dynamic transition between locus and platea modes of engagement. Uh, for a character such as Ariel, direct address to the audience and interaction with the audience was the absolute default mode, uh, leading to an exhilarating uh, series of moments of improvisation and of co-creation, as she asked spectators uh, to help her create the opening storm or to, to be the harpies who tormented the courtiers, uh, with the spotlighting function used to integrate members of the audience uh, in the performance. And finally, in Zoe Seaton's Macbeth for Big Telly, 
Zoom became an obscene space that was profoundly unsettling because the, the production kept activating that obscene imagination through the representation of spaces uh, such as the Macduff's home here on, on the slide, where you could intuit the sense of, of threat from the half open doors and the off screen noises to which you didn't have full access. Um, audience members were also quite disconcertingly pulled out of their home environments uh, and thrust into the Zoom sets where they appeared really out of proportion and out of place. And it was one of my most uncomfortable experiences as a spectator was sitting at the banquet and thinking, oh my goodness, I am tiny. <laughs> and everything around me is huge and I don't know how to behave and my head is disappearing into the background and it was just unbelievably stressful um, and uh, finally uh, a really sort of grotesque obscene uh, access to the pro production was sort of fostered by the extreme close-ups uh, onto Lady Macbeth's face as you got the access to the insides of uh, her eye, her nostrils, her mouth, and her degenerating mind. Uh, again, I'm sure that Lucy will say a lot more about the current work of the company and her plans for the future. Uh, but the big point that I wanted to make here is that, that this sort of digital experimentation that has been accelerated by the pandemic is hugely exciting, not least because it keeps demonstrating how digital media, rather than kill off liveness and co-presence and ethical engagement and reciprocity and performance, have been actually used by these creatives in ways that, if anything, intensify these modes of interaction uh, and give us a really powerful alternative way of experiencing theatre, uh, both during the pandemic, but also beyond. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Pascal. Thank you. That was a great opener for this. Um, yeah, I, I just, I mean, we might have time for a one. Uh, I, I have a quick question myself. Um, and I just like to, that I should, I'm really pleased that you talked about this, what you call the, this, this, the obscene mode, this, this, this space, this other space that sort of pulls the audience in through their imagination of off camera action. But I, I wonder if you can talk also, I mean, I see it in a way as a, as a way of concealing and revealing and possibly exchanging between not, not, not only the, the audience, but also the, part, the, the performers who, who are in different, different locations online. They, they come, they're, they're, actually, they're actually communicating in this, this obscene space. Um, you, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how widespread do you think that might be in, in all forms of, of, um, of Zoom, exp of, of online experience, and how, how, how we may have, may, may have adopted this uh, uh, almost unconsciously, this, this means of communication. So I, th I think it's really significant that one of the big things that has changed during the pandemic is that we've got access to each other's homes uh, in a way that is uh, obvious and, and ubiquitous and slightly unsettling. So um, I, I was aware that uh, I sneakily uh, smuggled some food into the university. We're not allowed to use non-university caterers, don't tell anyone. Um, but, but we had some food today and there was a box with food just on that chair before I switched the camera on. I saw that and I quickly removed it because that, that was an, an access into, into something that is forbidden. Um, that I didn't want to give you it now. I'm, I'm putting it on a recording and I will probably be fired. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. <laughs> th there's been this constant intrusion into each other's spaces and we've been, we've been communicating with students from their rooms into which they were locked in self-isolation. So they did not have any choice but to reveal their environments to us. Um, and there have been many moments where, where I have seen people's underwear <laughs> um, and, and things that you are simply not meant to see, mm, not mm. on them, but on the, on the, on the dryer behind them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it, it is that thing where um, I, I can see that Sarah has, uh, has blurred her background. Um, and 
the very fact that she is blurring the background tells me that there is something interesting in her background that she is blurring. And so it's activating my imagination about what it might be that she is deciding not to share so that we are in a place where we never have the choice to not activate the imagination, mm -hmm. because even when we opt into the virtual background, it, oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> How exciting. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> She's going full telematic on us. But it, you see what I'm saying? Sure, um, sure. But there is always this tendency now to um, assume that it's okay to, to enter each other spaces mm. um, and a very careful negotiation around the boundaries of public and private that mm -hmm. takes place through those interactions. And mm. there is a, a great deal of negotiation around that obscene boundary of the frame that mm. we're in. Mm. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. And I think it's you, you make a very good example, but it's also, as I've talked to having meetings with students and they might be, I'm talking with a student who might suddenly say, oh, sorry about the banging. It's my, it's my, my neighbor, my, my sister or my <laughs> making some noise or somebody else in the house. And it's that space, that sense of space that's communicated beyond the frame that we're in, but that is, that is so interesting and that actually is, is, is spatial. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Pascal. That's that's really, really interesting, really helpful, fantastic start. Um, I I don't wonder whether we'll move straight on, Satinda. So we we'll switch to the next speaker. Would that would that be okay? Hi. Yes. Yes. Let's. Um, we'll come back to this wonderful discussion. There's lots of. Uh, I was very struck by by this um, the way that um, Pascal talked about ethics and reciprocity. And it made me think about ideas around witness presence that is taking place as we, you know, as we move, move, um, uh, as we get further and further fragmented in space. But it's very exciting what you're presenting here is and what telepresence theatre is doing in in switching, switching us um, from, you know, things that we take for granted in the uh, normally co-present physical space into this digital space. Very exciting. Um, uh, so it, it's a great pleasure now to introduce Lucy, Lucy Askew, who is Chief Executive and Creative Producer at Creation Theatre based in Oxford. And they've been producing and performing innovative theatre productions in alternative locations and settings for over 20 years. And at the start of the pandemic, Creation rapidly pivoted to make digital work. And within three weeks of the March 2020 lockdown, they opened their first Zoom production, The Tempest, to international critical acclaim. They've since become leaders in the emerging art form that is digital theatre and creation were 2020 Oncom winners for Alice, a virtual theme park. And Lucy is listed in the stage top 100 for creation's work throughout the pandemic. And she's currently working on creation's forthcoming online production, A Christmas Carol at Home, which is in partnership with Hawksmoor at home while continuing to while continuing to provide their online home delivery program of drama and creativity workshops for young people. And it's at this point I'd like to pass over to Paul, who's going to um, um, introduce a video clip of their work. Paul, over to you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply just quickly show uh, a video. So, yeah, just, just before Lucy gives her presentation, I'd like to show a short clip from Creation Theatre's Telepresence Stage Residency, which they undertook with us earlier this year. And their performance, The Card Players, is performed by Giles Stokely and Graham Rose from their remote home locations. I think uh, one in Birmingham and one, one, one in Oxfordshire. So, so there we go. That's the remoteness. <laughs> now, this is their performance together. Uh, so let me just show you a short clip of this, 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 uh, this piece. It's a nice pipe. Sorry, I've, I've dropped a bit of tobacco on the uh, on the table. I don't mind much. 
Sorry, there's a little bit of tobacco there. Oh, I see. Is, that... Is this about my foot on the table? We each of us have our little foibles, don't we? I mean, uh, and I'm perfectly willing to accept yours if you can accept mine. That's more like it. <laughs> Santé! <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Yo, cheers. Help us off. Like, you know, look, there's liquid in. Snap! I will cover the stakes with um, the swing of it now. Probably. I wasn't expecting that. Set! Ha! Really dangerous. Oh! 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 Honestly, what is wrong with you? Snap! I wasn't expecting this one. Have a drink, guy. In the cafe, we're here with us. Thank you. Good. So, um, pleasure to be here. This place have a straw. I think they banned straws. Oh yeah. But... Sorry. What was the go? You've missed it again. I just apply slightly bigger hands to this job. Yeah. What? Well, slightly bigger hands to what I, I reckon I should be talking yeah. about here. Yeah. You think? Yeah. Hey! That's the ah. judge. There we go. Never mind. Let's go back to the cards. There we are. So let me just stop sharing the screen here. Just a uh, quick. There we are. Thank you. So <laughs> we'll hand over to Lucy. I <laughs> hope that's a. Doesn't preempt it too much. There we are. Um, hello, it's lovely to. Uh, there's a lot of people who have seen lots of our work, but never will have seen that. Um, what I hope is obvious from watching that is that the key, the key part of that little experiment we did was that they, no one was in the same room. So Giles and Graham, and then our aud unsuspecting audience member guy. We didn't deliberately select men whose name began with G. It just happened to be the way it fell. And um, we're all in completely, completely remotely. So that whole kind of all the interactions, all the items they're moving are separate items in separate locations. And um, so it was a really interesting um, project that we got to do with Paul. And we learned lots about how we can create that sense of 3D space and people in the space together. Um, so I have a little presentation that I'm going to share. And we're going to hope that this is going to have everything showing correctly on the right screens. Hang on, let me just get the... Uh, uh, sorry, minimise all the wrong things. Here we go. So I'm Lucy, I'm the Chief Executive for Creation Theatre. Um, as Paul touched on um, briefly, and I think Pascal mentioned um, too, we are, and Satinder in the introduction, we're traditionally a site-specific theatre company. Lucy, can um, I just quickly interrupt? In do, you, Oxford, you're in, do you want to just change your mode? You're, you're not, you're, you're in Oh, is it switched um, it around again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. There you go. That's it. Whatever perfect. we do, it always switches around to the wrong way. Um, <laughs> oh, so nice. we're traditionally, traditionally known as a site-specific theatre company. Um, we uh, have used like a wide range of different venues in and around Oxfordshire, uh, parks, shopping centres, bookshops, industrial estates, car parks, anywhere that really helps us to tell a story. Um, over the pandemic, you know, sort of towards uh, 2020, we were moving more and more into making work with video and projection um, and creative uses of tech and sort of game theatre. So we were slightly heading in a digital direction, um, but really only, you know, only dipping our toe in the water. Um, and then 2020 started to happen. Um, quite extraordinarily, um, the show we were working on at the moment, the pandemic really sort of began to hit at the beginning of 2020, was a production of The Time Machine, uh, which was written by Jonathan Holloway. And we worked in partnership with the Wellcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities to build all of their research in. And essentially it predicted the pandemic. Uh, so I won't talk more about that now, other than to say, 
it predicted the pandemic. Uh, so it was a very odd experience. And I think it's quite a key part of the creation story um, because it actually is one of the reasons that we um, we managed to pivot really quickly is we'd essentially been tipped off that this was a, uh, there was going to be, you know, one day there will be a pandemic and this is what will happen when there is. Um, so as Pascal said, we, we pivoted really, really quickly and we did a production of The Tempest with the incredible big telly theatre company. Um, and we started to play in Zoom and we really, we really totally fell in love with what we could make digitally and seeing it as a way that we could connect with audiences and that we could get presence and that we could get audience interaction and that we could get an emotional response um, from an audience. So the Tempest kind of gave us this really exciting start and gave us a sort of quite a strong feeling about audience interactivity, audience seeing themselves in, the, in an experience, the importance of kind of spotlighting people and them holding up their dogs and all those kind of interactions and gave us some principles that we started to explore with the early work that we did. Um, I'm now gonna just show you, I've just realized Paul, I might need to quickly come out of my presentation and share screen again, because I think I forgot to do the optimized video thing. That's fine. So we'll just stop and start again, hopefully from the right place within the right way around. So, Here we go. Is it the right way around? No, it's gone the wrong way around again. Isn't it? The other way around. Yeah, yeah. It's a determined to switch it every time we go. Right, let's just catch up with where we were. So this should all work now. Uh, so I'm just going to show you the clip. So after we'd done the Tempest, we then moved our production of the Time Machine into Zoom as well, and we continued to explore what we'd done with the Tempest in terms of how we could make it a kind of interactive experience for the audience, but also how an audience could be present in an experience and see themselves in it in a topic that is less, you know, the Tempest was a very... It was quite a sort of uplifting experience, the, the, the shows that we created, whereas the time machine was always quite a prescient, at times dark, very kind of ethically minded, at times slightly confrontational show. So, so what it means to be present as the audience in that. So I'll just show you a little clip of our trailer for that. What I need is to know what time must I go to in order to head off this disaster which is all around us. There was perhaps a window of opportunity around 2022, but that was maybe the last chance. <laughs> So we'll skip on there. Um, so with the time machine, what we did was we had a lot more audience choice. So no two audience members will have had the same experience through the show. So it had elements of sort of choose your own adventure using breakout rooms and sort of voting for where you wanted to go next. And as you saw briefly in that clip, moments where the audience became a sort of background to live performance. So we had moments where they were filtered and upside down and moments where your movements were kind of mirrored and sort of became a sort of strange, surreal background to one of the scenes. And um, we also, with Time Machine, sort of really pushed that how we could use virtual backgrounds. So for me, one of the most exciting bits of the last year was when we managed to sort of perfect that moment where Sarah Edwards there walked down a corridor um, and pressed a button on a screen and had doors open. And that was all done just in Zoom with virtual backgrounds. So it was a really hacky way of taking conferencing technology and turning it into kind of a live 3D environment. Um, so that was the time machine. And then after that, we moved on to going even further with the audience interaction with our production of Alice, a virtual theme park. So I'll just show you a little bit of Alice now. Yeah. <laughs> 
and we'll move on there. Um, so with Alice, it was really, we set us, it was again, it was a co-production with Big Telly and, a, and um, a company called Charisma Entertainment who do interactive AI. And we set ourselves the challenge of going, how can we make a kind of virtual theme park? Families can't go out and do things at the moment. How can we give an experience you can do as a family with children? Well, there's a lot of choice and a lot of interaction and a lot of, you know, you've got live performers, but you also are having, you can navigate your own way through that experience. So you would, essentially it was built in Zoom still. So you would have a performer in Zoom, but you would do a small scene in Zoom. Then you would be ejected out of that call to a website where you were given a selection of choices and you chose where to go next and that took you to another live performer and then you were booted out again and the the choices had changed and you could choose where to go and it culminated in the whole audience together participating in a in a live um cro uh, croquet game uh, we made in collaboration with a company called rocket dog where you drew a hedgehog on your phone and then the hedgehogs were on the screen all racing each other in little balls with the red queen shouting abuse at you all for how bad you were um, so it was really taking that interactivity to a real kind of extreme it was very active you did like musical chairs and um, so musical statues with the red queen you know children were sort of jumping up on, on chairs to join in so it was very very pushing the interactivity as far as you know to a real a real extreme the next challenge for us was the christmas show the slide up at the moment Apologies, I'm going to show you a trailer now that features these three jokers who are not professional actors, but in uh, isolated lockdown conditions, the best we could get for this trailer. Um, and this was our production of The Wizard of Oz. And actually, The Wizard of Oz was significant in saying, you know, we actually this is about a Christmas show and a Christmas family experience and that's a big part of our year at creation and we know that the the kind of rules of what audiences want at Christmas are slightly different to a promenade show or a piece of game theatre or a piece of immersive theatre and while they want those moments of interaction and feeling seen and acknowledged they actually also want to sit and watch this on their tv with a big bowl of popcorn and with some old wine so we set the challenge of how can we make, can we make something that's more about a kind of ambient audience experience a shared audience experience which is still live but is much less about sort of choice and interaction and active participation and um, so i'll just show you a little bit of this trailer oh darling the simply ghastly covid business means there's no theatrical production that we can take the children to this year if the finest performers in the land can't transport us while they physically sweat before our eyes well I don't see what the point in Christmas 2020 is at all. Your mother's right. While it's our civic duty to stay at home, I'm afraid, my darling, we will not be able to go and share the magic and merriment of live theatre performed by real live professionals with our family this year. But wait! Help is at hand. At Creation, our team of theatre didratists have found a way to beam live theatre into your living room. Via a complex process, our performers are broken down into microscopic pieces beamed to your device, where they are then reassembled onto your own computation machine. But wait! Another hand is at help! Christmas is a time for sharing, and this year you can share a whole lot more with your family. Aunt Mildred in Zurich, no problem. Uncle Kenneth and his partner Chad in New York. Get them a ticket. Granny in East Grinstead. <laughs> She's already booked. Wherever you are in the world, you can tune in and watch live theatre together and have a look at each other's Christmas decorations while you're at it. Ugh. But wait! What theatrical delight will I be watching? Well, I was hoping you'd say that. Allow me to unveil the eighth wonder of the digital world. The wonderful wizard of Oz. There's no place like her. So Oz, as well as having, you know, sort of um, this sort of 
new approach to interactivity. So it had some moments where you saw the audience and we sort of spotlighted, we auditioned dogs to be Toto, but it took the structure more of a traditional performance. We had two halves, we had an interval. We also had a kind of front of house framing on it. So there was an AI front of house character that you could talk to pre-show. So it was a real kind of emphasis on building up the framework of theatre and the anticipation and the sense of an event. Um, so after Oz, we then moved on to what was one of the most, ex you know, the most exciting bit really for us of our kind of journey over the last 18 months, which was we had a digital rep company for six months. So with Innovate UK funding, we had five performers working full time for six months, just an incredible team, experimenting with lots of different things that we could play with digitally. Um, so the first production we started with was Grim Tales for Fragile Times and Broken People. And what we did with this is we took another approach of going, we'd worked a lot with chroma key and virtual backgrounds and vision mixing and we said well actually let's play with what if we give each of our performers a theatre but a very small mini theatre so they all had a little built environment around them and then we mixed that in we found again interestingly that where we had initially thought that the audience being seen a lot in the experience was really key that actually as the pandemic went on there's a sort of trend developed for more and more people turning cameras off and seeking that less and actually wanting to watch more so we the show took the approach more of you didn't see each other throughout the whole performance until the very end and at that moment you were invited to light a candle and turn your camera on and we had these really sort of beautiful moment of kind of remembering that you weren't alone and that other people were there. So I'll show you a really tiny bit of this one. What's that? Tell you a story. Was once a poor man, so poor that he could barely feed his 12 children. So imagine his pain. We were born into darkness. <laughs> Do you want to see the moon? So that was Grimm's. Uh, and then the next two shows we did were The Duchess of Malfi and Romeo and Juliet, but I'll just very quickly just show you a couple of images from. And with this, we worked a lot with um, vMix and sort of vision mixing, and our director, Natasha Rickman, really played with this idea of rather than sort of trying to green screen our audience so they looked like to our cast, so they looked like they were in the same space, of actually using opacity and layering to create this new visual language for how we could tell stories and how we could create sort of co-presence between our performers and um, Romeo and Juliet again sort of pushed that sort of sucked the audience back in with more interactivity um, and it had again it worked with um, using breakout rooms and choice and zoom at the beginning but then it moved into branching video and she had the most complex web of options and journeys you could go on through the branching video and then went further so although it was pre-recorded branching video in some sections there were QR codes in the video that by scanning you then went into a live call with a performer so again really sort of playing with that what it means to be live and to be filmed and and how we can kind of um, transition between the two of those and then my final thing I was just going to quickly throw in at the end is as well as that six months with our, our rep company our Innovate funding also funded us in building our own platform for digital theatre and when we say platform for digital theatre we literally <laughs> mean it we made our own alternative to Zoom we've only performed one show on it so far as a, a sort of soft launch but Auditorium is really about all about how we can create co-presence in the experience, a sort of ambient audience and awareness of the audience being there together, laughing together, clapping together, sharing a theatrical experience, but one that doesn't necessarily run loads of interactivity, it's actually about just kind of a communal shared cultural experience. So I'm gonna show you a really quick, slightly scrappy thrown together video that we made as a, as a kind of uh, example of what a promo for it could be. This autumn, Creation Theatre will be escaping Zoom with the launch of Auditorium, a bespoke digital theatre home. Ticket holders can explore the foyer and even chat to other audience members attending the same show. Auditorium is a quirky and creative space for digital work which extends the audience experience 
and builds anticipation and excitement for online events. Once the show begins, you can see your fellow audience wave, clap and share in a unique moment in time. And that's that concludes the presentation. And I think you can see there that we there's a general theme there of thinking that showing your dog is an important part of, of feeling live and sharing an experience with an audience. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you. Um, that's really great. It really, it's such an overview of your work. Thank you. Um, I, I've got a, one. I may ask a quick question before, and I know Pascal has put a very good, very good question in in the chat that I'd like to ask later, if that's the right, Pascal. I think when when we've had Sarah's talk, really good to put that that question to both Sarah and and, and Lucy shortly. But just a very quick question before we move on to Sarah, and it's really about your your new production, A Christmas Carol at Home opening later this month. And you're collaborating with Hawksmoor at home, which is a sort of, as I understand it, an online Christmas meals on wheels kind of service almost, um, who audiences can order a Christmas meal from to be simultaneously eaten during shows. Can you talk, just talk a little bit more about um, the importance of the communal audience sensory experience or ritual and the role it plays in the collective experience of the production, why, why it's there for you? Yeah, I think it's really interesting because I think we've realised there are loads of different ways that that can be achieved. And actually with the Hawksmoor one, so Hawksmoor are this sort of really high end steak restaurants in London. And much like us, they went on the creation journey of a sort of a rapid pivot in lockdown and discovering that they could reach new people and they had an entirely new business there. So for us, it was really appealing to, to sort of partner together and go, what can we create? And when we started making it, we were convinced that like it's got to be live so you're going to eat your food and it's going to be live and it's going to be so lovely because you'll be eating your food and you're going to see all these other people having their Christmas meal and then we started doing the R&D on it and I ve we very quickly realized that if you've just been delivered quite a high-end meal that you've got to cook there would be nothing more stressful in the world than having to get the timings right so that you were sat in front of the screen at the right moment with another audience and being able to compare how well they'd cooked their meal and also that there's a there's an, uh, there's an uncomfortable thing about being seen eating on a screen I still I still if I'm in a meeting and someone brings me food have to do this to eat it and then come back on again and and yet I would eat food in front of you if we were in a room together so you know we kind of realized that was an uncomfortable dynamic but actually that the communal sharing in that situation was the meal. You have to do the meal with someone else. So actually we've constructed it in a way that is about the interplay between the people in the room with the digital work. So they get the, the digital show that they navigate through and there's some interaction in that, but they also get a little, conveniently, I've got a little stack here. They get a little stack of boxes that come in with the food that you open as you go through the show. And there's things in that as a phone call, you phone this, you phone Scrooge and Marley and you can listen to their automated phone call and press buttons and talk to ghosts and things. And um, so again, it's all about that, how you keep that, that uniqueness of that moment. It's not a film. You can't just sort of watch it mm. in March. It won't be the same. It's still got these elements that are unique to you doing it at that particular moment in time and bring it alive. Great, thank you. Thank you. That's really interesting. It's a fascinating show. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, we're going to move, move on to our final final speaker um, to, to Sarah, and, and Satinda is going to introduce Sarah. Um, so I'll hand over to Satinda. Ah, oh, thanks, Paul. No, that was that was a wonderful talk, Lucy. Really interesting, great discussion. Um, uh, so it's. Wonderful to have Sarah Ellis with us. Um, Sarah is an award-winning producer and director of digital development at the Royal Shakespeare Company. And through her recent partnership with the UKRI Audience of the Future Programme, Sarah led and produced Dream, an online virtual Midsummer Forest experience for the Royal Shakespeare Company um, that Pascal referred to, inspired by Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, using motion capture cameras and 3D gaming software, Dream explores how audiences and avatars could be experienced as possible futures for live performance. And in 2013, she was listed in the 100 most influential people working in gaming and technology by the Hospital Club and Guardian Culture. The culmination of Sarah's research and development over the past years is now available through the Findings in the Future website. Um, so a pleasure, Sarah, over to you. Thank you. It's really lovely to be here. I'm actually not here um, and I was playing around with Pascal earlier 
Um, and this is actually a digital LIDAR scan of the colonnade. And I think one of the sort of themes of what we've been talking about in this session and what we're talking about a lot in practice and academia and is how we've responded to constraint and how we've responded to a profoundly difficult time. And in that, how artists and practitioners have innovated their way through that. And it's through the edges of that, I think that many brilliant work over the, that's not yet been made will emerge and come through. And I suppose just to sort of say that as context that yeah, we've now scanned all our building in a profoundly difficult time, but we now have that building in a game engine to, to explore at our leisure as we develop through this. And I think it's important to say it's about not what we've lost, but what we've found in this in this conversation, and 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 how we how we hold on to that. Um, so I'm going to share some slides and have a chat and talk through some of our work and um, get into the sort of like nitty gritty of yeah, just share it in a in a way that sort of talks about the nitty gritty, but also what we found and what are the sort of potential possibilities of excitement and learning that we can take forward in our, in our work going forward. I always get anxious when I skip share a screen on Zoom. It never, ever goes, ever goes. Um, and as you can see here, uh, here we go. There we go. So to quote another UK cultural icon, tomorrow belongs to those who see it coming. And that was the spirit in which we embarked on the audience of the Future Consortium. Um, it built on the work that Pascal spoke about of Google, the Google collaboration and then the, the Intel collaboration around the Tempest, because I believe that if you collaborate with people that don't look like you, don't sound like you, that can offer something to the mix, then what can happen is that you can find something new, you can unlock something new. And it's a really valuable, um, as, um, it's a really valuable part of how we've approached digital work at the RSC. Um, Traditionally, we've always partnered up with technology companies or practitioners or other makers, but in the audience of the future, we were also collaborating with academics and research partners. And it's a sort of big shout out to the University of Portsmouth that we couldn't have made what we made without their resource and infrastructure to make it when we weren't able to do that. Um, so the Tempest um, in back in 2016 was quite a seminal moment for us because it brought a lot of that technology onto the stage and applied that into to traditional making of the work. And what was interesting is just some of that technology wasn't ready yet. Or some of that technology isn't, the technology isn't about replicating um, or making redundant technologies and tools that exist already. And I think that that's the debate that this, um, the Tempest also brought up is a sort of like, when you're bringing in these new technologies, how do you embed them meaningfully into a tr traditional theater making toolkit? How can we imagine them? How can we get creatives challenging them, showing their vulnerabilities as tools and um, also thinking about the storytelling aspect and really fundamentally thinking about our audiences. And one of the outcomes of the Tempest collaboration was um, we brought people in in our traditional audience sense in through the Shakespeare and out with the technology, but we also brought an audience in through the technology and they came out with the Shakespeare. And if you ask most people what their favourite scene in the play was or that particular production, it was the drinking scenes with Stefano and Trinkolo and there was no technology in that particular scene. And that was a delight. And that's that was a really interesting moment. But as Pascal says also, um, what the Google collaboration did, and we experimented with Tempest, which was we did a Snapchat filter for one day where you could aerialize your face. And um, it was just an experiment where we played with a creative asset. But in that day, we reached 7.5 million people UK only. And again, you go, what do you do with that if this is your home? What do you do with that when you think about this space, this convening space, this ritual, this, this, this place of shared experience and this place where people come together, a thousand people every night and have a shared experience? How do we create the reciprocity? How do we create the connection? And how do we work with a generation that are comfortable um, coexisting in a virtual and in-person space now? 
how do we think about those things meaningfully and how do we um, not think about it in the 20th century model of a, a broadcasting model where we're, we're, we're putting content out there, but how do we have connection that is, that is together? So all, ultimately all of this just comes back to togetherness and, 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 and the tools are just enabling that. And one of the things it's about what tools you don't need and then what are the tools that you are useful to you to achieving that and that's and that's um always the the challenge and also when the technology is genu genuinely ready so we were due to do this um performance which was completely different to what we did so we due to do this performance in stratford upon avon it was dream it, we, we were taking over a, a shopping um uh, a, a massive shop in Stratford and we were going to take it over and you were going to come in and have a beautiful immersive experience headsets projection mapping interactives loads of storyline beautiful and then the pandemic hit and all we had was the music from the Philharmonia recorded the week before and this was a collaboration not just for the RSC but for the Philharmonia Orchestra Marshmallow Laser Feast and Manchester International Festival and pretty much the first thing I did was make sure people were okay and paid. Everything stopped, the doors closed, everything stopped. And we had this project that we had to deliver, um, was still needing to be delivered, and we had to completely pivot the entire production. We were probably gonna do the most awkwardly socially um, inappropriate performance for a pandemic because it was full of people it was full of touch it was full of interactivity so what we did was we asked audiences where they were at and we did an old piece of audience research to go how are you where are you and three compelling things came back to us audiences were craving togetherness they were craving liveness but there is a huge digital inequity in people's homes we can create these tools and technologies in, a, in an auditorium for you. We can build that, we can scale that, but we can't do that in your home and we can't rely that you'll have the technology that we require for that most cutting edge experience available to you. The other thing is that if we are looking in inequity and we're looking at the world that we want to be in, then we need to provide everyone as much as possible an opportunity to experience that. So accessibility and inclusion came quite became quite up front and center and I don't think in all fairness we would have thought about it as much as we did had we not had this constraint in this moment upon us so what we did is we had to completely pivot it to an online experience but using immersive technology that was testing it in a pipeline but how it was distributed was as equitable as possible so this wasn't something that was available in a VR headset not because we didn't want to not because that wasn't exciting, but because who has one in a general <laughs> in a general world? Not very many of us. So um, we've made it for tablet, mobile and desktop. And in that we tested a form of interactivity would be possible in those devices. And we also were, were working in a very, very uncomfortable, I think the third lockdown. But what we did was create a volume which was this space from scratch, a motion capture studio in Portsmouth Guildhall, that where the actors were bubbles and every um, technician was bubbled. And that's how we created our stage. And it's a seven um, meter by seven meter volume here and gridded because we were making a virtual world and a live world at the same time. But the forest we made in a game engine was seven kilometers by seven kilometers. And that's a really exciting thing for us to think about as we move forward. Here are some of the characters. We, it was inspired by Midsummer Night's Dream and, and in some ways, some of the critique from the performance was narrative. The intention through the R&D was looking at experiential and embodied narrative and trying to make you feel that. So that the linear storytelling of that was challenged. Interestingly, we saw marked differences between age ranges of audiences experiencing that too. So younger audiences were much more about play and interactivity and not so worried about being held on rails. And then a, a more traditional theater audience required that text structure for us to experience it. Um, you'll see Lauren here, she was playing Mustard Seed and her entire performance was just her face into an iPhone and using real time facial expressions. And Puck is the rendered character here was made of stone 
and it's wrapped around with fireflies who are the interactive element and the fireflies you um, threw into the forest to light Puck's way through the experience and the entire story was about getting through something and a storm occurring and getting through it and it was just that's that's how we wanted people to feel because that's how we felt people were feeling in their homes. We pushed the boundaries of the motion capture more than we ever did in Tempest. We were looking at multiple performers in the volume. We were looking at the physicality. One actor played an eyeball. Um, but <laughs> we really played with scale where mustard seed was the whole mycelia network. And um, as I say, um, uh, the, the, there was an eyeball and, and we played with the physicality of the motion capture. And if we were thinking about casting in the future, if we're thinking about um, how we can use motion capture, um, particularly around um, physicality. Motion capture allows us an opportunity not to think one-to-one -one human, but to think one-to-many or one-to-whatever. Um, that's a really important facet around the, the creativity and the usage of those technologies. But for all that wonderful, lovely dripping technology, which was delightful, some of the biggest aspects of this project were audiences and how we held audiences at this time. And also how that it's not always the shiny thing that really is the most illuminating thing. Um, and sometimes we can get caught up on the new and we can get caught up on the scale. But actually the fundamental pieces around this is that we needed to build not just the experience and the content, we needed to hold our audiences in an online space for them to come together to experience what we were experiencing. Everything that has been said already, I'm just <laughs> reiterating <laughs> in a different way. So we created this website called Dream. You could test your technology in advance before you bought a ticket. So it tested whether you could do the interactive experience and if not, the passive experience. The passive experience was just as delightful, but we were testing the commerciality of that and the willingness to pay and whether there was a difference between what people were willing to pay for an interactive and a passive experience. And also we, it gave you a much more of an audience experiential welcome to the site. So we created this audience experience timeline where you had all the pre-show, but we then looked at the onboarding. So you weren't onboarding in the experience, you were brought into the experience. And again, the Q&A bar at the end, we were trying to replicate those um, things that you do when you go to a theatre and go to the bar with the actors afterwards. And then, and all the all really important audience um, focuses. And because it's collaboration and because we were doing something differently and unexpected, actually that brought a wider range of um, coverage for us and a really important contextualization around how we are pushing forward and how it's not theatre responding to the world that we're in, but theatre driving the world we're in and the immersiveness of what theatre brings and all of that brilliant craft that is and expertise that's there and how that can that can actually impact on gaming, impact on film. And we didn't know at some points, were we making a game? Were we making a piece of theatre? Were we were making a piece of broadcast? And that whole perspective of having an individual POV in the generation that we're in is completely fractured and how we think about our co-presence in that has completely blurred and is really exciting. And I don't think we yet have the pedagogy or the uh, understand you know I mean the rules yet yeah, around that and that's again really exciting so the audience response was really important to us and in a time of pandemic we changed the times of the performances we didn't just think you were coming to a seven o'clock show in Stratford we programmed it at 2 a.m to hit the Asia Pacific market and the U.S market so people had the experience in the time zone that suited them you weren't coming to us we were coming to you and we needed to make you feel that you were having the best experience possible. And if that's the biggest shift in what we've learned is that now homes are cultural spaces. If we look at the social media that has informed us and what we learned back into R&D and to innovate, we need our audiences with us. We need our audiences telling us what they're finding interesting. We need our audiences to connect with us about how they want to experience it. Because also the generation we're in, we are dealing with a fracturedness of a, we will never be in another time when there is a generation who have lived pre-internet and a generation have grown up with internet. 
we are in danger of a polarization. And actually, if anything that theatre is bringing at us is bringing together and convening around different ideas. So actually, some of the most social media content was the, the countdown clock where everyone was like, "Woo! I'm really excited. I want to be here. Something's going to happen. And I'm watching it and I've got an ice cream or I'm watching it. I'm in a school. I'm watching it. And um, I've got 5000 people with me and that sense of isolation and that togetherness. We were re trying to connect that liveness. And again, it was the nuance around the detail of how we welcomed audiences in that. So here's just to give some final beats of how I think homes as cultural spaces have come together, how people make their homes and embody the experience they're in. And it's not just a square screen anymore. And that's something that can go further and further and further. In the 10 performances we did um, online, we had 65,000 audience attenders. 76% of those were new to the RSC across 92 countries but 40% of those audiences were Generation Y and Generation Z. And for me, what do we do with that? How do we welcome people? How do we connect? Are all the big questions for us going forward is how do we hold the things that we found at the most profoundly difficult time? I think that's it. I hope I haven't gone over. That's fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. <laughs> so Tinder, did you want to follow? Follow up quickly. Um, well, well, Paul, um, m m I'd be happy if you wanted to to start. I, I <laughs> there's a lot. Wonderful. Well, no, yeah. I yeah. I mean, I think it would be. I mean, a quick question, perhaps to to um, to Sarah before we. I'd like to go to Pascal's question very quickly, and then then there's a, I open up for other questions. But um, I think I think in, in other. So you've also talked, Sarah, about sort of the, the um, you refer to, to magic in, in theatre quite quite a lot. Am I fair to say? I don't know if you. <laughs> I never. And, I don't uh, know. Probably. I mean, I'm sorry. I may have picked up some, somewhere. <laughs> may I put another talk you did where you talked to that about talked about the role of magic and and, and I, I guess well let's elaborate on that. In a sense, we're we're presenting, we're conjuring, we're we're presenting. Ma the, the, there, are, there are tricks. There's technology. Um, that people have yeah. to act, that, 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 that we're presenting to people. We're trying all sorts of different ways. There is a there's a magic. There's certain magic in that. And I'm wondering how much of it, how much is, the, is it important for the audience to know perhaps the technology that you were, you were engaged with with Dream. How much do, do you feel that the audience need to know or should know or how, or, or is that important um, to under, to sort of engage in in, in the piece. It, it was important because we were funded to do that. So from that perspective, it was important. So it couldn't, it couldn't just be, that was, that was really hard to achieve, if you know what I mean. That was a technical challenge that we, we, we had to use real-time technology. The interactivity, so where the challenges are there is that the um, server capacity to broadcast out is one thing but to create a real-time feedback loop with an audience to come back is really, really hard and takes a lot of server power. So, you know, but you don't want an audience to know that, do you? And then also, like, some people will know, of how, will have known how technically difficult. And we did the first multi-platform real-time, do you know what I mean, performance. Mm. I mean, a gaming company hasn't done that. An arts organisation with a collaboration has done that. But that doesn't matter to an audience. And an audience member cares whether this, they have had an emotional connection. So for it, for, for us is, do you, have, you know, one of the questions for us is, can you have an emotional connection with a digital avatar in, in that way of performance? And what are the, what are the questions around that? Um, I think that magic is easier than fear. Um, I think that magic as an emotion, as a, as a theatrical device is easier to achieve. Um, and it, with technical, um, you know, with uh, te with technology, fear and um, threat and um, tension are much harder. And that's interesting to look at next. And I thought the Macbeth work was really, mm. really lending itself to that. What Lucy's done with creation theatre is absolutely fantastic. So I don't think <laughs> it's like one of the, you know, talking really candidly, one of my biggest bugbears that the, the, the the, the, the audio was up sync and we always forget audio whenever we do anything like this it really yeah. bugged me because it's really it should be really simple 
And you did get like tweets, which were like the audios out sync. That's really annoying. And you were like, yeah, it really annoys me too. And that those bits are the, do you know what I mean? Those are the bits that bug me. Um, uh, yeah. That, that's a really in, important, in, yeah. Uh, that's actually a question. I'll come back to that in just a moment. And, but I, I just wonder if, if I can follow on and bring Pascal back in, because pa Pascal had a question for both you, you Sarah, and, and, and Lucy. And um, Pascal, would you, would you want to put your question to, to uh, yeah, I mean, Sarah and Lucy? They, they have actually answered it to some extent <laughs> <laughs> through, through their presentation. It really does sound like that's the next big thing that both of them are thinking about. And it, it, it just, the, the question comes, um, so, so it was prompted by uh, the conclusion that, that I had to write uh, for my last book, uh, where the, the peer reviewers sort of came back and said, you, you're, not, you're not giving us enough, you know? <laughs> Think harder. <laughs> well, what, what are you really, you know, what are you going to, and for me, it was like, you know, this is, this is really tough. Um, what am I concluding? I, I, and I went into this deep reflection. It's like, what is it that I miss about theatre most? I thought, no, actually, I've had these really engaging experiences of theatre during the pandemic. They've been online, but they've, they've completely ticked that box. The one thing that I really still miss is para theatre. It's everything around it. It's you know I, I can I can get digital theatre to give me the fix of I'm having a theatrical moment of interaction with performers. I can feel the liveness. I can feel the co-presence. But I can't smell them. I can't hear them. I I'm not rubbing it up against them. Uh, as I'm looking for my seat and there aren't these annoying people who are putting their bags right where my feet belong, you know, and, and I miss that. So, so that, that for me is the next barrier. Um, and I can see that Sarah's dying to come in. <laughs> no, I'm passionately agreeing with you in a way that um, uh, I think it's, also converging the live and virtual and having a performer hold both spaces is super interesting and when I I was only allowed in that volume on the final performance and the performance that I watched um, with the motion capture suits and, and everything there was so beautiful and so wonderful and we do you know what I mean exactly what you're saying we can we can it's not an either or we there's something there Pascal around that that is delightful and also the things that are unreplicable being a wonderful thing and like we think about digital as a form of acts you know you weren't there so this is a sort of version for you I think it's a co coexistence now and I'm I'm yeah, I'm passionately agreeing with you. I'm going to mute now because that's that's all I've got. <laughs> I was going to add that I think it is something that, like you know, we've been exploring and we're really interesting. Is that kind of the whole everything that frames the experience and the anticipation, but also being very aware of that that those are also a lot of the elements that can be the barriers to theatre, and particularly for our more neurologically diverse audiences. You know, it, it can be the, the the crowded foyer and the noise and the unpredictability of the the activities that happen before a show starts. Normally, once a show starts, actually, you're in your seat. You understand the I know what's going to I don't know what's going to happen in the show, but I kind of understand the contract here between watching a show. But actually, I don't necessarily have control over the journey from my house to the theatre and the stresses of the parking and where the toilets are and what the queues are like for the toilets. So it's kind of it's what we hope to take all the good bits <laughs> and all of the exciting bits but in a way that we can remove some of the bits that can be anxiety inducing and use it as a way to make more accessible work mm. and I, really I, if, yeah if i can come back in it's, it's, it's this idea of that the home as a cultural space really really speaks to me um and i, I was just struck by those photographs that you showed sarah of, of the audiences with their glass of wine um in, in front of their, their screens and and the meals that Lucy <laughs> is having um, you know, delivered to people. Uh, what it seems to me is that, is that we're moving towards uh, 
a form of theatre in which we make the audience actually create that para theatre for themselves within their homes. Um, and there are new rituals. Um, and I'm just wondering to what extent your you, thinking is going more and more towards hybrid modes of engagement. Yes, very much so, <laughs> big yes. Um, it's all about, I mean, the generation, the generation we're in, the self-publishing, you know, people publish on their own platform, that all of that, it's sort of like people want, it's interesting, the younger audience on Dream, you had like these beautiful anecdotes from kids going, I want to play with Park. There was no question around connection. So we, again, it's seeing those those two, those two sort of um, very clear um, generations that have been defined by the internet. Um, really, I, I just would like to see a convergence of that. And I think the audience is all about that. It's all about, it's all about the audience actually. Um, and there's I so think much like more. Sarah, yeah. I think like Sarah was sort of describing with, with Dream as well, it's like hi, what, what we're fighting slightly with it. Well, I feel what we're fighting slightly within the industry is a lot of people wanting to do hybrid and hybrid being it's in a theatre and we're streaming it and simultaneously there's an audience at home and like that and actually hybrid where the hybrid bit is the audience at home and they're making content and they're contributing into it or I'm quite interested in hybrid where actually it's about sort of manually operated tech experiences so websites that look like they're all super techie but really it's human intuition that decides when we press a button and decides when the next thing happens like to me that's what the exciting hybrid work is but within the industry we are fighting it I mean you know like I get so many creatives approach me going I'm really excited about digital I've got this idea what it is is we're in a theatre <laughs> no <laughs> no do make that that sounds lovely but that that's not that's not the what we're interested in this is something that is made for digital primarily and the hybrid bit is the audience mm. Please. Um, it's uh, just a couple of thoughts. Um, as you were all speaking, um, I was intrigued by the idea of gravity pulling. I think one of you spoke about gravity pulling. Um, in, in music research, people talk about entrainment, where you're all pulled to a rhythm, pulled to move together in a particular way. Um, and, uh, and this idea that we're in silos in some way and yet our silos are becoming enriched um and and somehow we can experience our silos together um in a very interesting ways so which is completely different from walking into the theater space and somebody putting their bag in front of where your feet would be um the, the this um is it uh and somebody also said um i think one of you said uh, mix into the oh I, have I got the phrasing right um, something like the differences uh, mixing in, um, you've got these tensions you've got these differences that you're you're dealing with um, technologies and um, ways of doing etc and experiences and silos somehow oh let me try and get to the point here um, that this is what's happening with the ways in which you're all exploring the theatre um, and collective experience um, is allowing for possibilities of how we can be collectively together um, that allows us flexibility for moving from an individ the individual to the collective individual to the collective in ways that perhaps um, if you were sitting in an audience, then you would feel very self-conscious as you're saying, you'd feel worried. Am I laughing at the right time? Should I clap now? Um, and all of these things, oh, I'm coughing. Am I, should I try and contain my cough? Um, whereas in an audience, we could probably switch our mute on when we're coughing or something so that we don't disturb that space. Um, I'm not quite sure where I'm going here, but- The space is less sacrosanct that's what's really interesting the democratization of that and the cultural biases which lucy was talking about 
earlier are really important is that, you know, for some people, all of those rules that you've just talked about aren't really very nice rules to occupy, if you know what I mean. And there's all these different reasons for that. But what I'm saying is theatre, I mean, Pascal, you're going to have to come in on this because theatre always hasn't always operated with those constraints. Like there has been times where, you know, much more riotous audiences and such. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying, but I'm just throwing it out there to Lucy and Pascal just to go, they know more than me on this, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, theatre used to be much more interactive and, and it's actually technology that came and stopped that to some extent just by the introduction of lights. So once you started to have lights concentrated on the stage, that meant that you didn't have the lights concentrated on the audience and the audience was made to shut up. Uh, this is a gross overgeneralization, but it, it did happen between the 18th and the 19th centuries. And, and then once you start to have real sort of uh, floodlights, that's the end of interaction to some extent. And that's when you start to have naturalistic theatre. So that's when you, it coincides with Ibsen and Strindberg and Chekhov and, and that sort of fourth wall performance. Uh, but before then, you, ha you have much more interactivity. Uh, and it's it's a much less regulated space in that sense, uh, it, it, which which is a lot more porous as well. And I think the the idea of switching the camera off or arriving late to performance, these are the things that we are able to do now. Um, they used to be possible. People people used to just go to the theatre whenever they felt like it. Uh, they they weren't so fussed about missing the first act. In fact, it was cheaper to go in later, so you'd go in later um, if you had a tight budget. So, so I think we are relearning things that have always been there, um, uh, and those modes of interaction with with a performance that allow us to be much more free about what it is that is or is not okay. You know, is it okay for me to eat? Yes, of course, it's okay for me to eat. Is it okay for me to just sort of switch a camera off and walk off? Yeah by all means. Um, but if you if you think that back into a, a traditional theatre space, so if, if I go to the RST and I dare um, <laughs> have a suite and unpack it during the performance, I will get killed. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating to listen to this conversation. And I'm wondering if I can just go back to a little bit to something that Sarah said earlier on, just to sort of a question to all of you, really. A very simple practical question, um, which I think is very useful and it's useful to know, is um, how do you think, how, 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 how have traditional theatre roles and jobs changed through creating online theatre? And actually what sort of, actually what resources and support do you still need? What, what is, I mean, you mentioned sound, Sarah, earlier on, and we forget, we suddenly forget, oh, don't forget sound, and you're absolutely right, and I've been there. And, um, but yeah, Maybe you could just talk about talk about the kinds of roles and jobs people might we might be needing in the future. Yeah, no, I mean there's a massive convergence. So there's already pre-existing skills. Do you know what I mean, in the in the um, theatre industry that are really adept and and just just bring more learning into the roles and and such like that to be really clear. But we did do a design schematic which was shared on findings of the future of life performance of what we thought the new structures were, because there's significant things around the streaming, there's significant things around the, um, the making of any digital assets around riggers, motion capture technology, um, visual um, artists, but also you need people that are designing in a 3D space, not a, it's not um, a 2D asset. Um, these are all people that work really differently so I'll give you an example. It's an anecdote. It wasn't funny at the time, but it's funny now. Um, so Puck is made out of stones. I've got two anecdotes. Um, Muck, um, Puck is made out of stones. And when we were talking to the um, designers who, who were making it, who the coders basically, and programmers that were making those digital assets, we said, oh yeah, the, you, you know, the stones are gonna move, you know, Puck is gonna move like this. And literally it went, stones don't move stones don't move because they're thinking really literal and anatomically so and that's a common aspect is that a theatre language and an imagination of what is possible it's not how you're taught 
how to make that work because you're taught the physics of it, you're taught the reality of it, you're talking about gravity, and you're talking about the anna. I can't think of the word. You know what I mean. And then the other one was um, fireflies don't <laughs> don't look like that, and you were like, they do in this show. So yeah. it's a you. I may it may be funny, but actually it's a really important beat that actually theatre industry can work with a brief and work with that and imagine that and that's the cultural shift the roles are one thing but it's actually the cultural application mm. of that yeah yeah it's interesting we, I, you had a similar guess, thing with realizing that a um a, a theater designer when they're talking about a 3d model is talking about something completely different mm. to people who work in um, games design and having to intercept in a stop building a model out of cardboard that's not what they mean they're building <laughs> they're building models but realizing there's so much like literal language the language of tech and games design can be very very similar to a language we use to talk about incredibly different things mm -hmm. absolutely there's a couple of questions actually i can see there's a, a question um in from from Lara, Lara Weaver, and I think there was a hand up as well. So I wonder if I can take some of the attendees' questions now. Um, did Lara want to? I can't see. I can make Lara. Uh, <laughs> I can allow you to talk, Lara. If you'd like, like, to, like to give your question. One, two, one, two. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, we can. can one, two. Hello, thank you so much. This has been really, really fascinating. Um, so I come from a, a music background and a performer background. So I was interested in, you talked a lot about the audience reception and feedback and their responses to liveness and participation. But I was wondering if you got any feedback from your performers as well. I guess I was thinking about Dream, but any of the other projects that were discussed about how their experience changed in the digital, because I know I gain a lot from the audience in live performance and I haven't felt the same to the same extent when I've been performing digitally so I guess I'm interested if you could comment on the performer perception of live and presence and an interaction and yeah any thoughts on that yeah yeah I mean I think all the all the company that were cast came from a physical theatre background so it was, we were expecting a lot of physical um performance and embodiment and um the thing that um i think they well lots of the things that because we reflected a lot on it basically through the experience they sort of it was quite nice to reflect after um and it was the sort of connection that they had together but then where were they looking mm. who were they connecting with and so we had the screen and that's what audiences were seeing so we had this huge led screen in the background so they always had that connection with the, what the audience was seeing that they couldn't see the audience. So for the fireflies and the interaction of that was a moment and the curtain drop scene that we put in that was deliberate. So you could, the, the company could see the fireflies coming in the space at the same time and having that co-presence. But I think that's where you're looking at the convergence of film, theater and gaming coming through that actually it's that new space that's super interesting, exciting. And then looking at a performer holding both and how they hold both may not be about eye contact anymore but about physicality and touch for example digital touch knowing something is there with you not do you see what I mean and so yeah. so I think it's they, they it's breaking down the sort of neural pathways of what what connection means and rebuilding them in a different way um, and how important the performer is to that but with each other they were very 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 connected and they were they were what they were always aware of from their perspective was hitting their mark in the digital space so they had the physical space but how they it wasn't just a simple oh it's that mark every night because of the calibration of the motion capture and and any form of live performance the mark where the marks were changed subtly and how say like puck landed on a branch was all, that's what they were really conscious of is making sure that their physical embodiment in the in the virtual world was really accurate because that was something for an audience that that would have um that would have really hindered their experience of enjoying it that's super yeah. interesting thank you <laughs> thank you lara um I don't know, lucy did you want to say something about that or pascal would you like to comment comment on that well, i was going to say pascal probably has uh, Absolute, the yes. the insights uh <laughs> from talking to our the, our casts for Tempest. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it was really interesting because um, th they were creating this amazing um, experience of co-presence for us as the audience, but they themselves were not able really to um, interact because they, 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 they saw themselves on the screen and they, <laughs> so they didn't really get any feedback and mm. they, they felt quite frustrated about that. And some of them tried to have two screens so that on one screen they would have the audience and get audience feedback while on the other one they had the, the normal sort of Zoom show going. But that was really distracting because they couldn't, they, they mustn't look at the audience, right? Because <laughs> you can see the eye line really clearly. So, so I think there's um there's a sense that they were they were always on stage on the Zoom stage. They they were very aware that they were never off camera, um, and that they were always performing, even when they weren't performing. Um, so, so it's that thing about being an ensemble actor <laughs> that you you actually have to contribute all the time, even when the spotlight isn't on you. Um, so that that was made for an extremely intensive um, sensation, I think, of their own presence, but not necessarily of co-presence, um, which is different for the performer than it is for the audience. So I think that there is there is a new dimension and it, and it required an enormous amount of upskilling for them, um, precisely like as Sarah was saying about hitting their mark, about uh, you know doing the eyeline match when you when you can't see the direction in which the other actor is looking, but you know that you have to look up there in order to meet their gaze as they're looking down. So, so there is an enormous amount of um, awareness of the virtual presence of the other person, but but without them being there. Uh, and that that is is requiring a rewiring of your brain uh, and and an acceptance, I think, of that absence. Uh, but I, I'm actually going to throw the question back at you, Paul, <laughs> uh, about those experimentations that you did and, and the, the clip that you showed uh, with Giles and Graham, because I want to know what that was like for them, given that they were not in the same room. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's really, I think it's a really good, really important question. And I think the question really is, is for the, for, for, uh, for Giles and Graham in that in that piece, they in a sense they were performers, but they were also they were also uh, uh, viewers. They were participants. They were watching it as much as performing in it, and 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 really engaging. And, and they perhaps had the most ex most greater experiential <laughs> uh, event was happening for them. Um, and it, it really, I think, the challenge is how does the audience get that, sim that similar sort of that sort of proprioceptive uh, phenomenological experience of being with somebody else and, and, and performing together and, and feeling a sense of, of togetherness that, that the performers who are remote but are, are sharing a drink, sitting at a table together. And it's so that experience from, from I think what the performers can tell us from their experience is, is, is going to be really important and useful to learn from and, and how we can build on that to get the audience to have a little bit of that. We, we, we kind of brought, we brought in as, as, as we brought a, a guy, I think it was Guy at the end, and that, that's exactly the idea was to let the audience have a seat at the table. So how can we let our audience have a seat at the table is really the question, I think. And well, Lucy's obviously <clears throat> bringing in food for them, which is, which is, a, which is a, a, obviously a good sensory step in, in the right direction. <laughs> to say Graham is actually in the in the webinar, right. so uh, Graham, feel free to add, add any thoughts you have if we're. He's got his hand up. Let me let me allow Graham to talk. Wonderful. Uh, if I can, oh, he's disappeared. Where is he? I was going. Up, I'm trying to find a, a loud to talk. Oh, have I, Graham? Did you have Did you have your hand up? I can't. I'm not sure. Oh, oh no, I've got the wrong. Sorry, I'm allowing the wrong people to talk. I haven't done this before. You can see I'm a bit of a <laughs> learning. <laughs> Uh, Graham, allowed to talk. Uh, yes. Uh, Wonderful. Here, here I am. Thank you. Uh, it was worth chipping in rather than just sitting in the background and being silent while you were talking about me. 
But um, what, what was particularly exciting about that and in, in that experience, I came to a realization during the process that it was a, it, it, it felt like how it must have felt in pioneer filmmaking in the, the 1910s or the 1920s. There's this, there's this form uh, and it was really interesting to explore the, the, the liminal space around the art, artifice of it that we were, Giles and I were able to um, explore the margins of what was, what appeared real and what was sleight of hand. So uh, that was the most interesting territory for me was to explore that, the, um, the confusion and to treat it almost like it was um, uh, a game, I guess. Um, so it was, it was very enjoyable, but it, 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 it evolved having to kind of, um, it, Yes, be playful. That was that was that was the exciting thing. Thank you, Graham. That's really good. And actually, that might I, I realise we're just a little short on time, so that might be a little very really good to sort of uh, segue to my final final question, which really relates to that. Actually, I'm wondering if I can put a question to you, and it's really about it's a broad question. You may have answered it already, but I'm going to put it this way: uh, are, are we defining a new language in theatre, and is is this a transition from one narrative form to another? And, and a little bit towards what you know, what Graham was just saying, is this that just as George Melier was sort of key to transition from theatre to film, or the horseless carriage was, there was a transition from horsepower to motor car or whatever else. This sort of moment of time that is that is it's not one thing and it's not another. Uh, do you think we're at that kind of position now? And and is that exciting? <laughs> of course it is. But what direction might that go in? Or, or I'd have to, you've answered this, or you're, you're older answering it in lots of ways, but maybe you can elaborate on it. And no, I mean, I, from day to day, I kind of, I alternate between thinking this is totally a new emerging medium and like we're finding a new language and a new way of doing things that's a new frontier and moments where I think, are we just inventing cable TV? Are we just like inventing something that already exists, but we're just doing it on a different platform in a different way? And I think that is what's, that's what, I think that's its potential is that it's both new, but it is about sort of stealing from <laughs> from yeah, loads yeah. of different disciplines and art forms and more, you know, we need more integration outside of theatre. You know, theatre is is a kind of hive of brilliant people with curious minds who are great at playing with ideas. And it's now about like doing more work like Sarah's been doing and, you know, bring in the gaming industry and, you know, film and TV and like stealing and adapting and playing with all these different ideas and seeing where we end up. Yeah, thank you. I just wonder if Sarah, Sarah and Pascal would like to just comment, comment on that in, in either way, any way they want. I think we're making the work that needs to be made now and the people in the future will make the work based on the world they're in. Therefore, I do think there's something about, for, about form and the emergence of form. But I also think that theatre is not a, a space that doesn't innovate and is innovating and this world is um, physical and it's real and it's virtual, but it's also taking all the brilliant things that theatre has had to offer um, and artistically. So I think theatre will take what's useful and grow and change according to the social, according to the world it's in. But there's something else there that's happening, which is super interesting um, that I think um, we might be part of. We might not be part of who's that, whose form that is, is TBC. And I, I think, you know, there, there's a sense that um, the, the danger is that we try to do things that we've done before and that we replicate models that we're familiar with. So to some extent, theatre broadcast, which, you know, I've written about a lot and I've admired it. I do love it, but it's, it's very much creating television. Um, and 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 it's it's recreating something that we already know and 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 have mastered, and then it's trying to create this perfect product that is like a like a finished film, like a finished tele. I can't even talk anymore. Finished television film, <laughs> and um, but it's then judged by those standards. So if you have a slightly um, 
scrappy broadcast and the sound isn't quite right or, or, or somebody drops a cue or, or a mobile phone goes off, it needs to be tidied up. It needs to be made perfect, but not for theatre, but for that other genre that theatre is trying to be at that moment. Uh, and I think for theatre to be theatre, it needs to keep finding a different way of being. So it, it can borrow from theatre broadcast, uh, from, from, from television, it can borrow from gaming, it can borrow from all these different technologies from video conferencing. But ultimately, it needs to create something that is theatrical and that therefore also has that sort of slight roughness about it uh, and the imperfection which comes from being made very rapidly for a live audience in the moment and addressing the concerns of that moment because that that is where theatre really has an edge over television and cinema and all these other things that have these very very long run in times um, whereas theatre has the ability to respond in the moment and to do something that's relevant for that audience in that little pocket of time um, so, so I think that there's a lot of borrowing going on, but it mustn't copy or else it, it will never be as good as the other things yeah. and it won't be theatre anymore. I think I, everyone, we're all nodding our heads here, Pascal, because absolutely, I, I totally get that. And, and I think that's, that's, let's celebrate those things that, 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 that don't quite the, 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 the glitch, the, 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 the pause, let's make something of it. Let's, let's kind of embrace it. Um, that's so good. Um, I'm, I think we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna draw the, the, the panel to a close, but I just wanna just wanna really just, uh, it just leaves me really to thank the panelists again. So pa Pascal, uh, Abisher, Lucy Askew, Sarah Ellis for presenting and discussing their unique insights and innovations. And thanks to my panel co-host, Tinder Gill, and thanks to our attendees for attending and contributing to this telematic laser discussion, all the world's a screen. Thanks ever so much. Uh, and I'm gonna have to I'm gonna say goodbye, but we will have more sessions, more telematic laser sessions in, in the new year. Um, so we're looking for them also hand in hand with our project at the telepresent present stage. So lots of more discussion coming on. So thank thank you all very much. And I'll um, I'll say goodbye to everybody. <laughs>